Thank you, Paul. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, very, very pleased to be here tonight to present this, um, this, this information to yourselves around the five experienced in Liverpool. Uh, this obviously has taken place back in New Year's Eve, 31st of December 2017, and involved the King's Dock car park. Now, for those of you who may not be too familiar with the site, I'll explain where the site is and where it is in relation to the city centre and the surrounding buildings. Um, but certainly for our service, potentially one of those challenging instances uh, on record really for us um, it, you know, is, is certain recent history, post-war history, um, and it certainly has shaped the, the, our inf and influenced our approach to multi-storey car park fires. So without any further ado, I will begin. So King's Dock Car Park itself. So this is a schematic diagram of the King's Dock Car Park. And this is the, the um, a photograph from the evening uh, of, the, of the fire. So as you can see, you know, building which essentially is designed to contain vehicles, uh, solid construction, becomes completely involved in fire. Absolutely unprecedented behaviour of the building. Uh, but however, I will talk you through the points as to how we arrived at this situation. So as an overview of the site, we have an aerial view of the Liverpool waterfront. So the iconic Liverpool waterfront, for those of you who aren't too familiar with it, the city centre is off to the right of the image. River Mersey uh, in, in the background and the Wirral Peninsula is in the, uh, the far background. So the site that we are looking at serves the Echo Arena, uh, which hosts conferences and concerts, and is actually now the m and Arena, which where the Eurovision Song Contest will be taking place uh, next year. So quite quite an iconic site and quite a, a, quite a large part of the Liverpool economy. So... For an overview of the site there, we can see you know, the scale of the, uh, the actual site itself, the proximity to the river. Please ignore the construction work going on to the left-hand side. That is now a, a hotel. Um, and the former car park was sited well just below, uh, or just south of the uh, of the arena. And obviously, you see the Ferris wheel going up towards the Albert Dock on the, uh, the right-hand side. So the Staybridge Hotel is featured here because... The State Bridge actually forms a, a part of the welfare facilities for our firefighters during operations, uh, and, and their hospitality was really, really welcome during the incident. And these are residential flats. So, as you can see here, the diagram, you know, the, the, the site is in quite close proximity to the car park. So, as an overview, I must stress completely that the building or the former car park building is absolutely and fully compliant with building regulations comprises of eight levels. So this was actually seven levels and a basement area. And there were four staircases. So we're going to talk to you around the firefighting actions and the point of entry, uh, the main point of entry that we use uh, for this two. And these are both two hour firefighting shafts. Staircases three and four weren't utilized during the instance, but however, they offered up 90 minutes protected stairwells. And this access, access road here highlights the, the space separation between the construction of the, uh, the multi-storey car park and the stable hotel itself. So we zoomed in here now. now this, this area now highlights the, uh, the ramp area. Now, as you know, with modern construction, space is a premium. And for, certainly for this car park, the light grey areas represent um, car parking spaces so you can see that the fire loads or, or parked vehicles indeed were sited not only on the, on the horizontal flat levels, but also in between floors, up and down ramps. So as you can see, a continuous fire loads right the way through the building. This now shows you the residential flats. So this is the former approach road to the car park. So people who are using the, uh, the, the facility would have to access through this point here. So you can see the, uh, the entrance and the exit, exit areas there got underneath the flats and straight into the construction. And this then, if we come round the side of the building, so if we were stood now looking at the multi-storey car park, but next to the arena, this was a, a diagram of the, uh, the construction. So as you can see, concrete you know, throughout uh, the modular construction, uh, grills uh, throughout the, uh, the, 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 the facial aspect of the building. What you can't see here is that so there's some billboards as well associated with the building. So there's advertising hoardings and, and whatnot sort of affixed to the front. So. For us, certainly, uh, with the uh, the uninformed uh, sort of 
uh, eyes, we, we presume that this building would offer absolute solid fire protection. Uh, however, I will reveal during the presentation sort of how, how we, that, that was uh, compromised and, and how what the understanding is now. Okay, so the incident timeline. So the day of the incident, so New Year's Eve 2017, weather conditions, uh, quite bad weather uh, back, on, back on the day, very, very heavy rain, strong winds, winds in excess of 35 miles an hour. So imagine very, very busy, bustling city centre pre-COVID times, um, you know, Everyone's quite excited. Everyone's getting ready to go out and celebrate. So a, a real, a real sort of throbbing vibe around the city centre. Not to mention as well that the uh, the arena itself was hosting the international horse show. So we had a capacity crowd in the uh, arena, and the car park was full. So when we see the sign here on the right hand side for temporary stabling, this was an access point for open water for the fire service, which was covered with uh, with with te temporary stable construction to house uh, to house the horses for the uh, the show. So, as I mentioned before, wind direction, very, very strong winds traveling in this direction. So this is a south, a south easterly direction um, and are coming down from that, that area. So at 1624, I'll say this, the darkness fell by this time as well. Uh, at this point, first vehicle or the vehicle of this arrow here, it shows you the point where the vehicle was parked or where it finally came to park. However, uh, it, was, it was on the second floor of the car park. So if you were stood here or where the, this cross has appeared and you're looking at the car park, the vehicle's actually on this floor here. So as you can see, quite easily I, I access through the stairwell in the distance. Um, you have got some, uh, some obstruct obstructions here with the glass uh, facades. However, behind here, we have more areas for car parking cars. So 1629, the CCTV shows the first signs of fire. Now, this image here is very, very difficult to, to make it out. But if you, if you look just at the area where the, the uh, silver grey van is on the right hand side, we studied the CCTV and we replayed it and we played it over and over again to just to nail down the very, very first sign of fire. And for, uh, here we get a, a wisp of a puff of smoke, which develops quite quickly into a significant fire. So if you can see that vehicle, which, uh, which is parked there, the red, uh, red, the red 4 by 4 looking vehicle, that's our, our vehicle of origin. So through our fire, give you a bit of a timeline now around the fire service attendance, and we'll talk around some of the uh, aspects of human behaviour uh, in between the uh, points of ignition and the actual arrival of fire service assets. So 1642, the first 999 call went to MFRS. There, were, there was not... A great amount of 999 calls. I believe there was five in total. So when you look at the the, the amount of attention the fire gets, and the scope of uh, you know, the, the, the issue. So if you look in the foreground, so in the background there, we can now see some uh, some flames and some smoke um, emerging. But as we see, people enter the car park, and when we view the CCTV footage, people will stop, observe, and carry on about their duty. So uh, we, we, asked, we asked ourselves the question that, that, that why, why was this why was this happening? So if you look to the next slide, so as we see here now, fire has become much more developed. We have people who come in, drive past, sometimes cars will stop, look at the fire, and drive on and carry on and park up. People stop, observe, but nonetheless, a very, very small amount of calls. So the reason that we perceive for this to have happened, I'll explain it in a, in a few moments. So as you see, this vehicle here, uh, notices the vehicle uh, uh, starting to smoke at a very early stage. And this, go back a slide, uh, this lady here was actually one of our first uh, 999 callers uh, to, to the service. So you can see at the point that the first 999 call comes to us, you can see how far developed that fire actually is. So at 1644, uh, following receipt of the call, two fire appliances were mobilised. These were from the city centre and Kirkdale fire stations. Now city centre fire station is within a mile. Of the, 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 of the of the arena, uh, Kirkdale Fire Station is probably about two miles. So, to, uh, so given the time of night, they were there in, in a reasonable quick time. So, at sixteen forty-five, the event fire team were attended. Now, as you can see there, I thought you can make out from the image, um, the event fire team have gone to inspect the fire and to try and uh, make an attack on it. Now, they never got the opportunity to do this. 
as they only carry extinguishers for sort of short uh, attack, first aid, fire fighting, if you like. But the vehicle that they use um, is actually very, very, or highly resembles a local authority fire vehicle. So it's, it's kitted out with blue lights. It's got five written down the side. It's battenbergged. So our perception was for the low amount of calls that we received is that the public have seen this driving into the car park and uh, presumed that, that, that we're already in attendance and we're dealing with the fire. Hence, there was a sort of a relative calm around people entering the car park, albeit there was a vehicle on fire. So at 16.50, our first appliance comes in attendance. And at 16.51, the second appliance comes in attendance. At 16.53, both, both appliances repositioned to the plaza. So the plaza is the area I showed you before with the, uh, the stairwell and the grills. Uh, reason being is for this is they pulled up to the front area here. And due to the, just the obstruction with the, uh, the residential flats, they've not been able to detect any smoke, not been able to see any signs of fire. So they've moved around to the left. And where this van here is accessing this area, both appliances dro drove onto the plaza here and started to make an inspection on the fire. So our first crews have gone up this stairwell, which will become stairwell number two uh, when we start talking about the firefighting tactics later on. So car was uh, sighted here. Uh, from the statements that we took from the BA crews, even on the time of night, uh, there was no visible signs of smoke, no real signs of fire until the crews had made their way up and made, it, made an inspection on the actual floor. However, 1656, we can see the external and see that the fire is, is, is quite, you know, quite heavily progressed. Um, you can see the, uh, you know, it's certainly more than one vehicle involved and a significant uh, heat signature coming from the building. So at 1701, the first internal inspection had been carried out and a request was made for six, six fire appliances to attend due to the, uh, the scale of the incident and the anticipated resources. So for our crews now, pressure was on to uh, uh, set into water, Don VA, breathing apparatus, and make an attack on the fire. So at 1708, the first breathing apparatus crews are committed. Now, I know, I know we have a mixed audience of fire service and engineering here. So 1701, eyes have been on, and at 1708, we've had uh, a water supply set into, we've charged the riser, we've set up a bridgehead, uh, and we committed breeding apparatus crew. So that's a reasonably quick turnaround uh, to make an attack on the fire. So um, as you can see here, the uh, this, this was the state of the fire at 1656, uh, when the, uh, you know, the, 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 sorry, 1652, round up at the time of our attendance. At the time, 1708, when, we, when we've been committed, we can now see this is the same CCTV footage as 1708. So this small white line, in the image, this is actually one of the breathing apparatus uh, where there's a uh, helmet torch. So we, they're, they're, as they're moving through the spokes, so you can see a real deterioration in the internal conditions inside the building. At 1731, a request was made for make pumps eight. And at 1741, make pumps 12 was requested. So incremental uh, request for assistance uh, from our commanders on the ground. And if we just come back a bit now in, in terms of the time frame, we can we can talk around when them crews are committed in, be, in breeding apparatus. So this area highlighted in red is the uh, the presumed area from the CCTV image and from breeding apparatus where the statements to be deemed to be involved in fire. So you, you're talking upwards now of a single vehicle. This the vehicle the, the, the fire starts to spread exponentially and starts to spread to multiple vehicles. So this plan here shows you uh, the access of our crews from stairwell number two. So the rectangle, the red rectangle uh, highlights the, uh, the amount of vehicles that were involved, taken from statements from the breeding apparatus wearers. So they suggested uh, upwards of like 25 vehicles uh, involved with fire. The small red rectangle shows the, uh, the origin of the first vehicle involved with the fire. And the arrows coming in uh, represents our breeding apparatus crews with hope with charged lines of hose. So we can see a stairwell two, uh, two crews were deployed, and a, a further crew was deployed from stairwell three. So if you cast your mind back to the wind direction on the night and the strength of the wind, all the wind is being pushed from the from the left to the right across this image. So the wind is essentially behind the wearers coming from the, from stairwell number three and all the products of fire, all the heat, all everything else is getting pushed 
into the whereas uh, coming from Sterling number two. So really punishing conditions for our breeding apparatus whereas. When we interviewed uh, the BA wearers from Sterile Number no. Three, they they said that they were they were walking into relatively calm, clear conditions. But as they progressed across the car park, they become confronted with a wall of smoke. So once they entered that, then then they were they were, they were able to start tackling the uh, the vehicle fires. This further rectangle here just represents a, a further air ramp area, where so you can see now also you know, fuel loads and wind direction. Yeah, there's, there's elements combined here which will contribute certainly for increased fire spread. Okay, so there was a tactical change. So 18, 23 hours, fire, there was a notice, noticeable escalation in the fire. So this image shows you the, uh, the uh, it's taken from external CCTV and it shows you the area outside with some command vehicles, police, ambulance and attendants. Uh, and a relatively sort of calm sort, sort of environment, uh, albeit given the nature of the, uh, the incident. Crews inside uh, at this point uh, reported uh, a sudden deterioration uh, in the fire and a sudden spread in the fire and that they were having difficulty tackling and extinguishing uh, vehicles. So they'd extinguish a vehicle, move to the next, and the, the first vehicle would reignite. Two minutes later, the conditions changed to this. So as you can see, the, the, the working conditions the, the smoke logging, the spread outside externally, quite significant uh, and a real marked uh, deterioration in the behaviour of the fire. So between 1820 and 1825 hours, crews were withdrawn from sector two. So that was the, um, that was stable number two, and that was due to the worsening conditions inside the building. So they were now reporting back that um, there was potential running fuel fires, couldn't really make out what was going on. The heat was becoming untenable uh, and, and, and the situation was like something they haven't really seen before. So they, they were withdrawn on account of this, um, this really rapid increase in, uh, in the severity of the fire. At 1838, an emergency evacuation was instigated at Sector 3, so our, our stairwell number 3, due to the internal conditions and all our BA crews were withdrawn from the building. So that then dictated... I'll just show you this video now. And uh, that then dictated the... Um, the dynamics and the uh, and the tactics for our firefighting from that point onwards. So, if you watch this video now, I'm going to put it on. Yes. Okay, so before I proceed any further, so this was a still image taken uh, shortly after the, um, the that, that, that piece of video. But as you can see, you can see that the speed of uh, the fire progression, you can see it spreading um, horizontally across that floor. You can see the commander effect, uh, that the flames are bending out the, out the uh, openings and into the floors above. And certainly the, you, know, you can see that the, uh, the building was um, in, in a real dire condition. And in terms of our, our ability to be able to access it and, and, and be able to make it maintain an internal attack. So from this point on, all our firefighting tactics were defensive and focused on uh, protecting the properties uh, which were in close proximity, the residential flats, and ensuring that no harm comes to, to come to the public. So as I said, mentioned there, we contained the fire and we're looking at protecting the surrounding buildings. So as you can see here, you know, the severity of the fire uh, it, you know, and, and the proximity to the residential flats, so this really brings home uh, how close them flats actually were to that car park, albeit I must absolutely stress, uh, everything was completely within building regulations. So these, th these images were taken from the next day. So crews were deployed onto uh, numerous floors within the buildings and uh, played a uh, attack into the, uh, into the car park. And there's also monitors placed between the uh, between the, the car park and, and the uh, and the residential flats, and this was the, the aim of protecting the building. So as you can see, some real sterling efforts by our crews to make sure that that that, that was achieved. Uh, also, um, you know, a, a, a good news story in some respects. You know, that there was no harm to any persons at all. Uh, the flats were evacuated successfully, and uh, and there were no injuries to report. There were so there were a few occasions or a few reports of smoke inhalation. Uh, from the initial evacuation of uh, horses from the from the car park, uh, and from some members of the public who, who uh, tried to evacuate the vehicles, but certainly at this stage, uh, this was a, a, a sort of a really good result for us. 
another uh, image of uh, of that. So you can see you know, the the, uh, the the rendering and installation from the building is burnt away, but the actual instruction and integrity of the buildings may be maintained. Uh, and once again, no loss of a uh, of, of any property. And this is uh, another image. So this this image is if you were stood at the arena and looking towards the car park. Um, you can see now this from the next day uh, the extent of the uh, the fire damage and, and once again the proximity to the residential flats. Okay, so now we, we, we're looking going to talk around the uh, the why what, what why has this happened and why is that fire spread being uh, you know unprecedented uh, uh, and where is the learning uh, in this? So. So first, I'm going to talk around the drainage system. So this diagram to the uh, to the untrained eye uh, probably doesn't suggest much. So if I just can just take take a second to explain what it actually represents. So the two shapes coming in you know, horizontally across the image they represent the floor of the car park, and where we have this uh, 15 with the gap here, this is a drainage channel. So vehicles come in, and these drainage channels are placed actually right underneath each vehicle. Uh, across the car parking spaces. So the idea is vehicles will come in wet, park, straddle these, uh, these 15 millimetre drainage gaps entirely, and all the runoff, uh, the floor will be slightly cantered in towards the drainage, drainage gap, and all the runoff from the vehicles will come to this 15 millimetre gap and drop down into, the, uh, into this tray underneath, that into a drainage channel, which will then be released from the building at a different point. So just show you what it, so if you tilt your head sideways, this is the, uh, the 15 millimetre gap. Or one of the undam undamaged floors, so you can see quite significant uh, sort of gap uh, from underneath each vehicle. And then from underneath, this is uh, an undamaged uh, section of ch uh, ch uh, drainage channel. So we can see the box guttering uh, is aluminium construction. So if it were, if we're all the way, aluminium will fail. Uh, you know, relatively early in a fire situation, you're talking around 450 to 550 degrees. And then we have a uh, plastic polythene pipe, which uh, runs from the drainage channel into the actual construction of the building itself. And then this goes into a further drainage system with it, which releases any of the rainwater from the building. So as we can see, um, there's a, a weak point, if you like, underneath the vehicles, which we, we, we had not legislated for prior to this instance. So this diagram shows us the origin or the vehicle of origin, uh, the, red, the red rectangle. And the red line going across the image shows you the aluminium drainage channel, and the red uh, dots are the uh, the polythene pipe uh, areas. So as you can see, the, the vehicles in quite close, close proximity to uh, a polythene pipe, and certainly the aluminium guttering. So just going to show you some of these images now around uh, around some of the damage from the from the uh, from the building. So this image will zoom in here. Although it's probably not entirely clear, there's a round sort of circle on the wall there. This is where one of the polythene pipes has completely burnt away. This image here shows uh, the damage and complete loss of the drainage channels. Now, if you can imagine, we have vehicles underneath and vehicles above this. Certainly a vehicle involved with fire will give out a you know, significant amount of heat, which we'll, we'll look at in, uh, in scientific respect a bit later on. But... Certainly any fire products, any heat, any flame will be concentrated up into the uh, essentially what is shaped like a venturi. And that venturi then will, will play upon the uh, the vehicles uh, above it, almost like a blowtorch effect. So once again, something that we had, not, no, had no knowledge of, uh, no experience of, but we're very, very keen now to, to spread and share the learning around, around systems of this type in multi-story car parks. So going back to the fire, um, one of the questions were asked around, you know, did, did we not see it coming? Did we not check the floors above? Uh, we absolutely checked the floors above at the time of the attack on the fire. So when we're talking around 1708, when the breeding apparatus crews were committed, a further uh, team of firefighters uh, and one of our senior officers went to the fourth floor and put their head through and had a look, and there was no sign of fire. We presumed at the time the <laughs> construction and there'd be no chance of fire spread unless it was going to come externally from, uh, from outside. Um, however, when we reviewed the CCTV footage, uh, 1753, there's, uh, there's been signs of fire starting in the distance. And if you look, it absolutely mirrors the floor below as well. So we're looking at the same area. At 1811, we have now got a fully developed fire on this floor. And this, uh, this, this time, for, uh, or within the time frame of the instance, uh, falls in line uh, with you know, shortly before the uh, deterioration in the fire, and it also echoes the um, the statements of the breeding apparatus wearers in the fact that they said, um, you know, to, to, to paraphrase them, 
it was like firefighting inside the volcano. There was there was a, there was running fuel coming from above. Couldn't work out where it was coming from, um, and, and it was, the conditions were coming really untenable. And it was the, the fire spread was uh, really unprecedented while while they were uh, internal on on third floor. So if we go back to the building here, this zoomed in image here, I'll just come back out of it here. So this shows uh, an aspect of fire spread between floors. Uh, to, and this just sort of just drives home the point around, you know, essentially what was going on on one floor was being replicated on the floor above quite quickly. So then we'll talk around the failure of the structure and the ramps. So as we can see some of the post-fire imagery, you can see that the, uh, the, the concrete has burnt through entirely. All the reinforcing mesh has been exposed. You can see the debris from the vehicles. You see the extensive damage, extensive heat damage. And you can also note as well the height of the car park uh, ceiling as well, quite low, quite a low ceiling. Okay, and once again, all the supporting columns, the building, you can see there's this real severe fire damage throughout. This is a uh, imagery taken from a uh, combined platform ladder. Of the uh, of the top floor now, when I mentioned before, no persons were hurt uh, in the instance. There were there were a couple of dogs uh, rescued the next day from vehicles um, on the top on the upper levels here, and they were they were actually safe and well when we got to them, albeit slightly dehydrated uh, with the, uh, the obviously what had gone on underneath them during the night. Uh, but yeah, you can see the absolute the devastation within the car park area. So. Going to return to the vehicles involved, uh, but before I do, I just just want to reflect back on the point of just uh, gone across the, um, the, the the concrete, the, the fire resistance of the concrete. We presumed would be reflect that of a high rise building where you're talking in, uh, uh, you know, sixty minutes or uh, you know two hour uh, fire protection for the concrete. The rated the rating for the concrete for this building is actually fifteen minutes, and it's, it is absolutely within fire regulations. And I'll explain a little bit why uh, as we get a bit further on into the regulations uh, in a few slides but i just want to come back now to the vehicles involved so if we look to uh, approved document b uh, volume two buildings other than dwellings when we talk around multi-story car parks um, the definitions that come from adb are that the fire load is well defined in that, that the vehicles that are in there are well defined where car parks are well ventilated, there's a low probability of fire spreads from one story to another. And open-sided car parks have a 15 minutes minimum period of fire resistance, hence the concrete uh, being aligned to a 15 minutes. And furthermore, there is no requirement for sprinklers. So the Ministry for Technology and Fire Officers Committee uh, produced a fire note, uh, fire note number 10 in 1968. Um, once again, we are looking and talking around vehicles from 1968, but the, uh, this information is predicated on. You know, in 2017, vehicles have massively progressed, not only in dimensions, but also in materials, in onboard technologies. Um, you know, notwithstanding, we're probably on the, on the very cusp of uh, electric vehicles. Uh, obviously, that, that, is a, that is a larger uh, industry in today's world. But, so I'll just talk now around this. So uh, fire note uh, number 10 says that fire will not spread from one vehicle to another. The disruption of petrol tanks will not occur and pressure relief valves will negate any explosion. Smoke layer will remain mainly at ceiling level. And the heat release rate is two megawatts. Um, so we'll talk around the heat release rate from modern vehicles in a moment. The, back in 1968, the fire service will attend within three to four minutes. So if we talk around the post-war uh, post world, um, still quite a heavy uh, provision of fire stations and fire appliances. Uh, so that, that was based on the attendance time would have been quite quick. And the, state, the statement uh, was provide, provided in that the experimental work carries out confirms the fact that an outbreak of fire is unlikely to result in an uncontrollable fire spread or in serious damage to the structure of the building building and that is based all on the statements above so bre report in 2010 uh fire car parks uh notable points has paid some uh, some 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 notice to the uh the fire note in 1968 and it talks around modern vehicles having uh, potential to have running fuel fires spreading the fire in the fact that 85 percent of modern vehicles have plastic tanks 
obscuration uh, is similar to enclosed car parks. So when we look at the King's Dock, you know, the, the grill's quite heavily uh, got a fine gauge of grill. It didn't allow us to play any kind of meaningful jetting from outside or to make an attack using the, uh, an aerial appliance. Once a severe fire has developed, the fire will spread to other cars separated by unfilled bays. So it also pays attention to the fact that the fire load uh, and the heat release rate for the modern vehicles is much greater. And that modern vehicle heat output on average is 4.75 megawatts. So within two minutes of the fire spreading to car number two, the intensity reached 16 megawatts with a ceiling temperature of 1100 degrees centigrade. So cast your mind back to the breeding apparatus wearers reporting punishing conditions, uh, difficulty extinguishing fires, and, and rapid uh, you know, growth in heat and, and flames, flame spread. So, however, BRE closed off with that the traditional view is that car fires do not spread is refuted. However, there is no evidence to indicate that the current provisions in ADB for car parks requires revision. So when we compare this to the King's Dock, our crews reported that 18 to 20 vehicles were on fire when they were first deployed in BA. If we look at a conservative uh, you know, estimates that a vehicle output is at five megawatts in terms of heat release rate. So then that will place the heat output in excess of 200 megawatts when we're talking around 18 to 20 vehicles with temperatures well in advance of 1100 degrees centigrade ceiling level uh, at this, and this no, it doesn't allow for very really exponential growth. So a bit of a science uh, section here now, so we'll talk about the heat absorption of water versus the heat output of the fire. So our main branches, so we, we operate with 52 millimetre uh, hose lines uh, and what, uh, our branches when they're working at high, you know, top efficiency will give an average heat absorption rate of 25 megawatts. So to extinguish a 200 megawatt fire, we would have required eight main branches on the initial attack. So that, that initial attack back in 1708 requires eight main branches to be in play at that point. Dry risers can provide three hose lines, one of which should be a safety line. So to provide all eight hose lines on arrival would have required all four dry risers to be charged, so all four staircases uh, with all eight hose lines deployed simultaneously. And this would have required 12 appliances, three pair dry riser, Back then, the PDA was two pumps to a single car fire, which was you know, absolutely correct with our, with our approach and with our action plans with fire control. Um, however, you know, we bring ourselves back to that first attack of 1708, where a request of six appliances has gone in. At that point, we'd have needed 12 appliances to be on scene, set up with green apparatus, all working you know, at, 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 at maximum efficiency, all risers to be charged, all the pumps not to be defective or, or have any issues. That there's a lot of a lot of variables within that were in that statement, which really you know it, it provides the basis for why this fire was so problematic and why it absolutely got away from us at a very very early stage and was absolutely untenable. So in summary, the heat output from the vehicles on fire at the initial attendance far exceeded the weight of attack and water available at the time. As our resources were increased, it didn't match the heat buildup. So as you remember, the incremental makeup from the, uh, the commanders, six pumps, eight pumps, 12 pumps, uh, really should have, should have been 12 pumps plus at a very early stage in hindsight. The building was designed with, the sa with saving of life as the priority and there were no human injuries directly related to the King's Dock fire. The building was designed for internal firefighting tactics with its you know, the, the protected stairwells and dry risers. However, the building did not behave as expected. And the fire spread between vehicles was not in line with the 1968 guidance and ultimately ADB. So now we're gonna talk around the learning. So this list here represents our significant instant report on Merseyside. So this was the product of probably around 12 months worth of work uh, with a team consisted of myself and a number of other officers who had to go out and interview um, you know, all the commanders, the senior officers, the crew, uh, fire control, uh, partners, stakeholders, and, and, and form opinion on all of these areas. So it's, it's far too great a scope for me to go into all this uh, during this presentation tonight. However, I'm gonna focus in just on the areas uh, in red on the here. So I'm just gonna bring you into water supplies. So 
As you can see, the area is extensively um, surrounded by water. You have the River Mersey at the top, and we've got the dock system as well, the King's Dock and the Duke's Dock. So, Wapping Dock, uh, originally on our action plan for the crews to respond, is our first port of call for any open water. However, due to an unfortunate breakdown in communications around the, uh, around the event, the temporary stabling uh, that was on this, uh, the, this pontoon uh, was not expected to have been there. So when our crews have arrived and they're setting into hydrants and they've, they've realised that there a greater need for water was required and potentially that involves open water, we can't get on. We couldn't get on this pontoon with appliances to be able to drop into the dock. Um, the, the ramps here that we do it justice. They're about ten meters uh, drop. Uh, quite quite a far out way for us to reach with any kind of uh, open water or hard suction hose. Okay, so we have the Duke stock. So I bring in to here. So as you can, see, if you can see where the Ferris wheel is, and um, we have a bit of a ramp going up here. We have fire appliances moving up and down these ramps here to gain access to water uh, on where the bridge is, just to the right of the ferris wheel. Uh, as these things play out, unfortunately, our first appliance set into the, uh, the open water and failed, couldn't, couldn't achieve a lift. And only, only after some um, some effort and some uh, and some actions by the crews on the ground were they able to replace the appliance, swap it out and, and bring another appliance in for open water. But a really, as you can appreciate, a very problematic site to uh, access um, with, with uh, you know, 20 ton fire appliances. The River Mersey was talked around uh, about in the water supply and uh, questions were asked around, you know, how do you have much, so much trouble accessing water when you've got basically the sea, uh, you know, sat across the, uh, the way from the site. So our response to this, when we look back, is for those who know the city will understand that the, uh, the Mersey uh, is also has a, ve a very significant sandbank uh, around it. And when the tide is out, you're, you're talking 30, 40 metres worth of sand. Uh, from the river, from out uh, from the uh, the dock side. So if you look at the diagram here below, we can see that low tide is at sixteen ten. So the, the tide actually doesn't come fully back in until half nine at night. So at that time, if we'd have tried to get open water or hard suction across the uh, across the sides here, we'd have landed uh, on 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 sand. That essentially, would be able to achieve a meaningful lift. Right, hydrants. So we did experience some issues on the night with hydrants, and that's been rectified since. So definitely some really valuable learning for our crews. So this snapshot here is from one of our mobile data terminals from the uh, the, the evening of the incident. So we tasked the water officer to, uh, to, to to inspect where the hydrants were. And as you can see on here, we have a line of hydrants running uh, along the back of the multi-story car park, and the, the next set of hydrants really accessible are to the right of South Key. Um, and there's a jumbo hydrant uh, up by Hearst Street here. Now, this green road here is it represents four lanes of traffic, and you can see there's a significant uh, over half a kilometre, uh, probably, probably up 750 kilometres, uh, so 750 metres um, away from the site uh, to be able to get into a jumbo hydrant. So following this instance and following some, uh, some joined up work with our partners at United Utilities, uh, we've managed to gain a... a, a United Utilities overlay for our mobile data terminals. So this not only gives you the hydrants, it gives you the private hydrants and it gives you the mains as well. So you can understand if you're working off a, a, a single mains or a replicated main, if you're overrunning the supply, um, certainly the private hydrants were something where the crews were walking and discovering hydrants, which were marked on the MDT. So this has been a real significant advance for us uh, to have this overlay. Um, certainly it had been great on the, on the, on the night of the instance. However, it has proved really useful in instance uh, since then and up to the present day. This uh, image just shows you, uh, that, that sort of demonstrates the distance from the edge of the dock up to the multi-storey car park. This doesn't include the, uh, the lanes of traffic that you'd have to traverse with, uh, with, with charged hose. Firefighting media. So water is our traditional go-to in Merseyside. We're trained for compartment fire behaviour training. We're trained to deal with uh, with flashovers. We're trained to deal with backdrafts, uh, and, and we do that by pulse firefighting. So that was the uh, essentially the media of choice for the for the for the night. CAF's compressed air foam system uh, is a a, a premixed foam system which is uh, sited on each fire appliance. It was talked around being used on the night. However, our procedures don't legislate for it being used internally. However, it was set up in anticipation of could an attack be made. Um, 
from, from a, 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 an external point into the car park. However, before a meaningful attack was able to be sustained, uh, the, the fire had developed to a stage where defensive fire fighting tactics were then in, in, in use. Foam, once again, very, very similar uh, situation with this. We don't use foam internally. We did discuss uh, around to make a meaningful foam attack on an incident of such a size would require all the stocks within Merseyside Fire and Rescue, plus, uh, plus probably drawn on partners from Petrochemical Industries and the airport. Uh, and we did consider a factor in uh, retrospectively around uh, putting a call into John Lennon Airport to ask if a phone monitor would attend uh, to make an attack uh, or try and pierce the side of the car park. However, once again, by the time we got the, the thinking had got to this stage, uh, the fire has, has, has certainly outstripped uh, any any capability to do this. BA procedures. So we we, uh, we were operated under stage two BA. So for those uh, fire service uh, that we had emergency teams in place. Communications and the dedicated roles that you know, go along with stage two BA. Uh, BA comms was a slight issue for us on the night, uh, certainly with the construction of the car park uh, and, and, and the business and the traffic of the radio channels. But there was some learning around command channels for uh, for our commanders on the ground and our sector commanders as, as assisted us to, to make some efficiencies and some, some good forward progress in that area. The BA withdrawal uh, was completed successfully. So we had two separate boards going in from, uh, or two separate BA boards going in from two stairwells. And the uh, the, the, the communication was effective between, between the boards uh, and, and that was backed up by actual runners as well to make sure that the evacuation had been completed. Uh, as I mentioned there, the board evacuation, we operate with the uh, Draga BA sector and Merlin boards uh, and, that, and that worked uh, absolutely fine. BA sector command was uh, was talked around, but was never implemented due to the uh, due to the defensive firefighting tactics being adopted. And our fire control room. So uh, bear in mind, this is New Year's Eve. Uh, Seventeen fire appliances were on the initial attendance, and a fourteen pump relief was managed from twenty fifty one hours. So we're talking to a lot of people here who uh, our staff who were due to go home at half eight at night to go and see the family, loved ones, start the celebrations. Uh, certainly some of them end up staying beyond midnight due to the scope and the size of the instance and, and our ability to be able to relieve in and out at that time. 16 appliances were managed through mutual aid, so from other fire services. 46 standby moves, so other stations uh, were stood up and the fire cover was maintained across Merseyside uh, throughout the standby moves. And 53 appliances were moved in and out of Merseyside between uh, uh, between the time of the instance and up to 0800 hours uh, on the 1st of January. And we dealt with 28 other incidents, thankfully um, all quite minor, low-level incidents outside of one person's reported, which turned out to be uh, something also of a, a quite low-level nature. Three high-volume pumps were stood up. Um, and requested, and National Resilience Fire Control was also stood up to support the uh, the efforts. And once again, just go back to a bit of a timeline around the incremental makeup. So certainly learning from us and something we try and instill in the instant commanders is um, is to try is to have the confidence and and not not be uh, not, not be concerned with going quite big on your makeup on the first on the first day or there. So as you see, we've got the big pumps three, six, eight, then twelve all across the, the, this time. Okay, so what was what's been our response? So we increased the PDA for multi-story car park. So up to this day now, uh, we will send four fire appliances and an aerial appliance to any 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 confirmed fire in a multi-story car park. We've introduced a multi-story car parks uh, facility to our risk-based approach to SSRI. So. Formally, information gathering uh, would, would be related more to a building and probably not focused as much on the car park. We now now have bespoke SSRI uh, information on on each multi-story car park as a standalone uh, throughout throughout Merseyside. All our internal actions were completed as outlined in our significant incident report. We shared the reports with uh, national organisational learning. And we shared our learning at a number of events, internal and external. Uh, when I say that, we've, we've shared it nationally and internationally. Uh, it, 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 it attracted a lot of interest at the time. And as we can see now, you know, five years on, the, 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 the appetite and the interest is still there for this instance. Okay, so I'm going to talk around what if now. So 
this looks more on international pitches. Car park fires, uh, there, are, there are growing concerns about the risks posed by modern vehicles and methods of storage. Um, I, I, you know, please forgive me for this. This presentation was created back in 2018, so there may be some, some uh, events in here which have happened since then as well. But certainly when we look back, uh, the fire in Gretchen back in Switzerland in 2004, where seven firefighters were killed. Um, Every CSM in Paris, 2009, 200 cars destroyed in a basement fire. Uh, very, very similar setup to what the King's Dock was with the proximity of the, the residential flats. And unfortunately, one person very, very sadly has lost their life um, in that instance. So I'm going to show you some more video now, and this this is intended just to show you a, a representation of what the conditions were like. Um, it, it's the closest thing we've been able to find, really, to replicate the uh, the, the, the working conditions for our crews on the night. So uh, it's, it's also American commentary, so just uh, be with you now. So this is the King's Plaza in Brooklyn on the 17th of September 2018. 250 to 300 firefighters were involved and 17 firefighters were injured, uh, and notwithstanding for members of the public also so you can see the, the scope uh, of the response to this uh, you know 250 to 300 firefighters for us that is that is half our service effectively um we didn't get any injuries 17 firefighters injured uh, I'll, I'll show you the footage now I are now under control, but it took close to four hours to get it that way a total of 21 people injured all of them non -life. threatening injuries take still all over the place here on Flatbush Avenue in both directions even now that the fire is out they're just working to make sure uh, that structure is intact after this huge fire they've got blocks and blocks closed off in both directions just past Avenue U on seven alarm fire more than 250 firefighters on scene. Most of the fire uh, out now, firefighters, again, checking the structure, making sure that it's still intact in certain areas. Unclear, uh, firefighters tell me exactly what caused the fire, but we know it started in a car in the parking lot and then spread from there. We're also still working to learn how many cars the fire spread to. We do know a car dealer was storing more than 100 cars in the lot, but we don't know how many of those were affected. Uh, earlier, we spoke to a man who was just a few feet away when he heard an explosion early this morning, just around eight o'clock this morning. Take a listen. I just heard a loud explosion and I look and then after that, it's like, it's like you heard another explosion. And then after that, you just seen like a few minutes after you seen a whole bunch of smoke coming out. Then it had popped up and I started recording and stuff cause it was like crazy. Okay, so the, the intention of that is really more to show you the, uh, the how that film behaved, how the smoke affected the, the surrounding areas, um, the fact that that, that, that that car park had no external covers, so it was possible for the firefighters to make an external attack on the fire using monitors from uh, aerial appliances. So similar in some respects, not so similar in other respects. So I'm just going to show you this footage from another video. So I want us, want us to think back now to the BA crews who are committed uh, at, the, at the early stage of the the fire and the reports of how the cars were behaving. This shows uh, uh, firefighters tackling uh, a similar fire on a rooftop. So as you can imagine, you know, we're talking around cramped conditions, ceilings were around eight foot high, all the heat would be reflected back on the firefighters. And just look at the behavior of the vehicles in the Jonas video. So I'll play this now. Well, another fire to tell you about. This one took out more than a dozen cars at a garage at Newark Airport this morning. Talk about the last thing wary travelers wanted to see when they returned home today. Now we have learned that someone's faulty alternator may be the reason behind this. I want to use reporter Tony Yates is live at Newark Airport with much more <laughs> on this fire. Tony. Wow, can you believe that, Liz? And the good thing about this fire, too, is that no one was injured. But they brought all those burnt out cars down from uh, that roof deck earlier this afternoon uh, and towed them away. And then the owner of the car that originally caught fire, uh, police questioned him. He told them everything he could about the incident. Then they sent him on his way. But I tell you, it was an incredible, unbelievable sight. 
Newscopter 7 captured images of the inferno that spread to a row of vehicles, lit them up on the fourth level of the Terminal C parking garage. But with the wind and no way to get fire trucks to that the flames using standpipes and running hoses up those ramps. On top of that, water pressure was slow, which led to the flames having time to jump to 17 cars. Authorities say the fire began in this SUV. Then the driver said he'd recently had the alternator repaired, but for some reason, his car caught fire. He did run for help. Officials took his information, and unrelated to the fire, the owner was found to have a suspended license. And Okay, so what we did then uh, in Merseyside, obviously uh, the report uh, was produced, and uh, you know the, the the sharing and the uh, the knowledge around this fire, we, we, we were very very keen to get this out uh, within certainly within the fine rescue industry throughout the UK, and obviously we have presented this to a number of partners uh, nationally and internationally. But what we asked for our own crews internally was to reflect on what if this happens again within Merseyside. So this area here is a really substantial car park, uh, which is on the other end of the city centre. Um, it is by the, uh, for those who know where Liverpool well, it's, it's just across the road from Lime Street Station um, and the Empire Theatre. So it, it's quite central to, this, to the city, if you like. And we asked the crews around what would be your considerations uh, if you had this on fire, given the information that you know now on, on the back of it, on, on, on the back of this presentation. So some of the sponsors we had were around, you know, uh, ensuring that the the floor above uh, was was, uh, was staffed and supervised at all times, ensuring chart your know, jets were, play, were made were laid out to floors above, uh, ensuring the makeup uh, was was you know, was, was of substantial nature uh, on the first on the first account, um, you know, ensuring the water supplies um, were we you know, were secure and, and and sufficient enough to uh, to tackle the fire. So a lot, a lot of discussion was generated and a lot of uh, a lot of learning was generated from this. Also, we discussed around the types of vehicles as well. So I'll just go through to the next slide and this talks around some of the what ifs. So these are the questions and the, the bit of the takeaway really we did. We asked our crews to uh, come consider. Uh, certainly, I'll probably ask you to do the same tonight. So we talk around uh, the capacity of the car park. You know, is, is it full? How much does it hold? Where are the vehicles sited within it? What's the building construction like? You know, is, is it compromised by grills, advertising hoardings? Is it, is it solid concrete? Is it not? Is it, is it constructed similar to this vein? Multiple vehicles. Once again, we've seen the fire spread and the way the fires behaved uh, you know, within this example and within the examples from America. Plastic fuel tanks obviously lead to early uh, early loss, certainly if they're compromised in the way that they were in the King's Dock instance. And that then leads to running fuel fires. Big question now for... All of us really, uh, in a, in a, probably in every walk of life at the moment, is electric vehicles, you know, what hazards do they hold? What what difficulty may they have added to uh, this instance had they been, uh, you know, quite prevalent? Uh, you know, hybrid vehicles, certainly, you know, we were talking around uh, the horse show, uh, a lot of four by four vehicles. Certainly some of them vehicles would have been powered by LPG uh, at the time and, and contributed to, uh, to fire spread or explosions perhaps. Uh, and then the, potentially the uh, the future for the ADB regulations, um, you know, do they need to be revised? Do they, do, do, is the is the you know a school of thought? If you get um, dry risers in the buildings, water supplies, I say you can go on and on. But this is what they, these are the main the, the main takeaways that we asked our crews to go and consider. So with that, we're going to look ahead. We'll ask you to reflect around you know, whatever industry you're here to represent tonight. What, what does this mean for yourself? What does this mean for your staff? What does this mean for you know, your, your infrastructure on your sites? And with that, uh, I will conclude the presentation. Um, if we're happy to stop recording and uh, I'll, take, I'll open for questions. Thank you very much.